Welcome to our backyard. This is the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We are two friends having a discussion after everyone else has passed out or gone to bed. Grab a drink and listen as we discuss everything from automation, space exploration, and why the meaning of life is 42. If you hear him howling around your kitchen door, you better not let him in. Werewolves of London. Today, we're going to be talking about Werewolves of London. Shit. Sorry. Werewolves of Colorado. God damn it. Wolves of Colorado. We're going to be talking about the wolves coming into Colorado and how wolves are affecting North America. But first, before we get into that, Nick, how you doing and what are you drinking? I'm doing great, and I am drinking a Coors Banquet from Colorado. It is the Colorado Kool-Aid, if you will. What are you drinking? Very fitting what you're drinking. I'm drinking some Jim Bean, and I am excited to talk about this. For those who don't know, on November 3rd, 2020, Colorado passed a Proposition 114. This proposition approved the reintroduction of the Gray Wolf back to Colorado. But before we talk about the news of what Proposition 114 brings and the possible future for Colorado and the rest of the states of the United States of America... Nick, how about you give us some history about the wolves? So wolves have always existed in North America. Well, and I guess all over the world. I'd say the most, the first wolf in literature is probably the wolf that raised Romulus and Remus in ancient Roman literature. Um, but for our purposes, we know wolves are in Alaska, and they stretch across pretty much every province of Canada. But what I thought was surprising, Mike, is the historical wolf range stretches all the way down to southern mexico i know they went south but i didn't know they went that far south there is wolves on the east coast pretty much everywhere in the united states except for hawaii (laughs) most of southern california yeah hawaii puerto rico (laughs) guam uh doesn't louisiana kind of florida you know southern florida kind of that area Uh, now Wolves predominantly reside in Alaska, but we're bringing them back in the lower 48. Definitely bringing them back a little bit. I assume we'll talk about Yellowstone, which reintroduced wolves in 1995. And wolves have always been kind of migrating, coming around from Canada and Alaska down to the United States, in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming. We'll talk about those states because those states are very important for modern wolf control, modern wolf relationships. And I kind of want to precedent this because wolves are a very hot topic. And with this past voting for this Proposition 114 in Colorado, it was the first time that a reintroduced species was decided on by the people. And boy, was it a split decision. The vote was 50.91% in favor of reintroducing wolves and 49.09% against reintroducing wolves. So right down the middle, and boy, Nick, I gotta say, seems like we might find ourselves opposite on the board for this one. Yep, wouldn't be surprised. I don't know how I would have voted. I, well, I want to say this right off the beginning. I don't think reintroducing a species should be up to public vote because people are morons, myself included. So maybe voting on whether apex species comes back to an area maybe maybe not up for the common man but nick you brought it out that you you brought up the point that wolves are slowly coming back to north america but i would say there's quite a few wolves already here let's see here in idaho and wyoming and montana all put together there's already 3578 wolves give or take few wolves because some of them are estimate based on packs and dens etc cetera, etc cetera. so 3500 wolves already in those three states that's quite a bit of wolves that's that's a big number considering they're apex predators yep and uh i want to clear something else up because this is something that i had been told which kind of found out isn't completely true uh a lot of people talk about that the wolves that are being reintroduced aren't the wolves that were traditionally in those areas In the United States, there's gray wolves and red wolves, and those are two distinct species. The red wolf occupies more southern range, and there's seven of them still alive in Mexico, and I think they're kind of on their way out. We'll see if they can bring their population back up. That's 
quite a bottleneck, but the gray wolf is the one that's being reintroduced. And there's three subspecies of the gray wolf in North America. And so for a lot of times people say that there's three different wolves and they're not bringing them back. They're bringing a different, bigger, more deadlier wolf back. Isn't completely true. It's not completely false either. It seems like certain scientists count them as distinct species and certain scientists count them as their own species. The wolf that we mostly have is the subspecies Arctos, which is a large wolf from Alaska and Canada. And the wolf that we're trying to bring back on the East Coast is Occidentalis, which is, for those of you who uh, don't know, that means West. And then the, I don't know the status of the Laceon, I don't know, L-Y-C-A-O-N wolf from the South uh, Western United States. That So you'll be seeing a lot that they're not reintroducing native wolves or reintroducing more deadly wolves. And that's not completely true, but not completely false. Like we were, we were talking before the podcast, everything about wolves is controversial. Whether you split them as three subsistence species or two species and one subspecies or three subspecies is up for debate. Depends how you want to classify them, but they have different sizes and somewhat different diets. But I think we'll talk a little bit later that diet is mostly uh, controlled by what's in that area, not really genetics. Yes, I would I would agree with that. Some wolves are more scavengers, depending on the, the other animals in the area, and some wolves are more hunting, going for elk, occasionally even moose and deer, et cetera, et cetera, like that. And kind of want to bring a little bit back into the Proposition 114 for a sec. So with this split and this rule and urban di- divide, majority of the reintroducing votes for came from urban environments, and the majority of votes against reintroducing wolves came from rural environments. I feel like we were just here. Uh, Yeah, it it comes full circle, my friend, doesn't it? But some of the major topic points for reintroducing wolves are we remove them, it's our job to put them back the way it is, and help restore ecosystem and educational purposes, and some of the major topic points against reintroducing wolves are Hunting, the effects of putting food on the table, money wasted on controlling the wolves and the conditions, and perhaps the biggest one, the effect on livestock. Yep. The effect on livestock is a contentious point because, well, farmers, ranchers, they care for their animals and not only emotionally, but that's an investment that now that's like 10% more likely to die if it's uh, like a cow or something that goes and grazes on Forest Service or federal land. Now there's another predator they have to worry about. And just me personally, we live, I live on the southern Oregon coast. We're like 700 miles the nearest wolf pack, but we had a wolf come down and kill, I think it was like 24 sheep just in our area. So this isn't, this doesn't just affect the areas around where the wolves are going to be released or rehabilitated, reintroduced. The wolves travel far. Yes, but this is a bit different scenario so before we proceed i want to there's an argument and statements that the wolves are already naturally migrating to colorado from wyoming idaho and montana which from all evidence i've came across is false yes there are some lone wolves and small packs by small packs i mean like two or three wolves not enough to sustain a population have made it to colorado but not enough to bring back the species to that area many of them getting hit by cars and some of them returning to wyoming because they like to range in that border area, immediately get shot. The wolves that have migrated to Colorado are few and scarce and not enough to do a full pack, not enough to do a healthy growth of a wolf pack. Wasn't it just six wolves on the Colorado-Wyoming border? It Yeah, it, I saw that, and I also saw some... I saw like one or two lone wolves down the Rocky Mountains a little bit further. It's from what I can tell, these are just kind of wolf outcasts or looking for a pack or got lost from their pack. It's very lone wolf scenario, not not introduced species to help maintain and watch and record them. But going back to livestock, this is probably the keystone argument for not reintroducing wolves. Would you agree, Nick? Yeah, and this is my biggest argument personally. Not argument. Like I said, 
I, I guess I'll, I'll talk about how I f view this. So I want nature to be as natural and wild as it is, right? I think that's something that we all want. But at the same time, I recognize that the economic cost of wolves re being reintroduced is not an economic cost we all burden, but is put on the shoulders of a select few. And so it's one of those things where it's kind of, it kind of reminds me of nuclear waste, Mike, where yes, it's good and a lot of people want it, but no one wants it in their backyard. Um, yes and no. Uh, I also, I agree with the not wanting your backyard statement, but burdened by a few, I don't know if I agree with that because wolves have quite a large range and they affect a lot of farmers, livestock, cattlemen, um, much less the urban environment. If this is the direct effect is completely rural. Right. That, that's what I'm saying is that all of us are voting on this thing, but the economic effect is really only affecting those farmers and ranchers, which the total, like we say, like one and a half percent of the total U.S. population is involved in agriculture. And so probably half of that farmers and ranchers. So like 0.75 percent of the population and then even less of them would actually have an interaction with the wolf. So something like 0.1 percent of people in Colorado maybe have the economic burden placed on them. I would agree with that numbers, but Nick, what if I would tell you that reintroducing wolves actually might decrease the number of deaths cattle have from predators? I would find that very difficult to believe, Mike. Well, from what I research, there's a good chance that it actually might happen. So, a little precedence. In 2015, in Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho, wolves were responsible for killing 148 cattle, 208 sheep, three dogs, and three horses. And like I said, for those wondering, in those areas at this time, there's about 3,500 wolves. The total deaths of cattle and calves in 2015 was 3.9 million. 98% of the deaths are non-predator-related deaths. Majority are storms, diseases, etc., etc., etc. But of the predator kills, 20% are done by mountain lions. And it has been shown with Yellowstone and other reintroduced wolves areas wolves would help lower the mountain lion population and like you said nick wolves have a range diet depending on their scenario and location so perhaps reintroducing wolves will help lower the mountain lion population your favorite creature in the woods to go frolic with and maybe have less cattle be damaged if the food supply for herds or more scavenger species like attacking beavers raccoons etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. I, was, I used to work down in California, and we were cruising some timber in the woods. We found like a, a carcass that I assumed was a mountain lion kill. But then I was reading, and there's a, a wolf pack who roams in that same area. We're within like 100 miles of that area, 200 miles. I was like, oh shit, maybe it was wolves. But yeah, no. I, I mean, yeah, I understand that's that's a competition thing. Um, you know, you can only have so many predators before your prey starts declining. And then, man, we should have, I'll post a predator prey graph to our Instagram. But so what happens, anything that a predator eats, right? I'm trying to think how to explain a graph on a podcast, but it's basically as a predator, if there's a lot of prey, the predator population explodes, which would be kind of like where we're at now. Right. So there's a lot of deer and cows and stuff. The predator, the cat population is exploding. But as those that population decreases, all those cats, those predators don't have anything to eat. So their population declines as their population declines. The prey population rises and it's a cyclical cycle. When you add another predator, there's still the same amount of prey. So now your population of those two both have to decline. So I I think you're still going to have about the same mortality. It might just be from a different source now. I'm thinking the mortality is going to decrease for cattle because wolves are not... Wolves aren't as... Aggressive isn't the right word, but it's the only word that's come to my mind, as mountain lions. Mountain lions will fuck you up. Wolves, they'll like, eh, can I take you? Can I not take you? They'll, they'll try to figure you out. So I can see wolves, especially if we condition them, which I'll get to in a sec won't go for cattle and plus nick with more wolves there's less mountain lions and mountain lions kill and, and i think in the lower 48 i think only two people have died since the 1960s from wolves attack if i if i remember that statistic correctly i could be wrong about that but yeah i think that's right i, I saw that too uh i don't even know how many people have died from mountain lions or been attacked by mountain lions i guarantee you it's way more than two this year well 
2020, not 2021. Right, but also wolves have been mostly extinct for most of that time frame, whereas mountain lions have not. That's a fair argument. And I... I see that I see that a lot of saying people saying that wolves aren't dangerous, which Oh no, they are dangerous. They are not, definitely dangerous. Yes. But people are saying definitely not as dangerous as mountain lions. And it's two different kind of predators, right? Your mountain lion is an ambush predator, whereas your wolf is a, a hunter. So you're it's kind of comparing apples and oranges almost, but you're and again you're comparing a population of a couple thousand to thousands. Just I mean, it's like comparing the amount of shark attacks to like wolf attacks, cow attacks. I, yeah i mean just you know there's a lot more cows than there are uh sharks so it's i don't know if that's completely unfair i don't buy it that that wolves are wouldn't go after not humans but like dogs and stuff and eventually maybe humans i mean if you're hungry you're hungry and with an exploding predator population and a which would then lead to a declining prey population, just the natural balance of nature, eventually they will get hungry. I, I didn't really think about the argument of how many wolves and how many lions they are. I completely for, for, uh, fully didn't see that coming, and I, uh, I completely agree with you where that makes a huge difference. So I, I retract the statement of, I, I still think wolves would be less likely to attack people, but I don't know if the numbers would be that different. Yeah, and it, it's uh, it's one of those things that, wolves i think have taken on a personality different from what they actually are like wolves definitely got the disney hallmark effect that's for sure yeah and you know i listen to i try to get you know listen to podcasts while i'm driving to work and stuff about different people's takes on wolves and you listen to some of these people and it's like they have i personally don't think they have any idea of how nature works they're talking about how like wolves you know they they really only eat elk and they'll eat berries and grass and some other stuff. It's like they're last I checked, wolves are predominantly carnivores. And I had to Google it because I was like, are these people right? Am I the idiot? But uh, it, just like cats, but it's it's like the devil, you know, right? You know, we have grown accustomed to living with mountain lions. Farmers are used to a certain percentage of loss due to them. It's but now do we want to add another one? And like I get what you're saying that it will decrease the mountain population. I don't know if it will decrease overall loss but or it might stay the same but it's just like as a farmer you don't want to a rancher you don't want to lose your your cows to to anything but i yeah okay you can keep going well i i want to bring to that point where it's easier to actually defend cattle from wolves than it is from mountain lions and this is gonna sound kind of weird but there was a study in 2009 that was conducted to lace a carcass with a drug that would make the wolves throw up, make them be sick, but not harm the wolves. It conditions the wolves not to eat the livestock, like to think, oh, if it smells like this, don't go after it. So, and from the results, they were very promising. But unfortunately, this was a small sample size because unfortunately not a lot of science is going into preventing more cattle loss, which is something I find strange because everyone needs to eat, so why not protect our food? But we might be able, we, I, I have not come across conditioning any mountain lion i you can't condition a house cat so i imagine conditioning a, a mountain lion would be 10 times harder but with wolves we can condition them a little bit to fear not fear to distaste cattle now i don't know if this works for other carcasses and again I, when i was seeing for prevention of wolves i saw like a lot of electric fences a lot of people uh having ATVs along with their cattle you can't that's an expensive option and it's really hard for a rancher who might not have that that's not that's not fair at all for the rancher but I like the carcass idea like if before we reintroduce the wolves into an area we train them not to like anything but say the game we want them to chase after yeah, and then you'd have to you know constantly do that and imprint that so the average wolf only lives like what three years I would say we would only have to do that for a few generations until the other wolves pick it up and start teaching each other. What was that? The the experiment with the monkey's ladder and uh, water, right? Are, are you familiar with the, what I'm talking about? No. Okay, so there was a lab experiment for, chimp, it might have been chimpanzees or monkeys, of how they communicate and how things generationally pass. So they put some food on top of a ladder, and every time they climbed up the ladder 
uh, before they got the food, a bunch of water would rain down upon them, making them cold, like loud noises, et cetera, et cetera. And they did this a couple cycles, so those chimpanzees knew. And then they brought in half new monkeys and left the half old monkeys. And the new monkeys, oh, they saw food. They could do that. The old monkeys would tell them not to do that. And then they took out those old monkeys, and then they kept doing that until it was completely separate. And the monkeys had no idea why. They just knew they weren't supposed to climb that ladder. They had no evidence. They had, like, just word of mouth, just no conditioning. They never saw the water, never met anyone who ever saw the, directly saw the water, generationally apart, but still knew not to do it. And I can see us somewhat doing the same thing with wolves. Yeah, I mean, I, I that makes sense. But it, to me, it seems like that'd be very difficult to do. If you look at, because wolves have such a varied diet, right? Like in Alaska, there's wolves that, well, similar to bears, they'll eat a lot of salmon as a regular part of their diet and move somewhere else and they'll eat something else. But certain, they seem to favor elk and moose, bigger game over just deer, which to me, you know, they're... Obviously, I know the difference between a deer or between a elk and a cow, but I feel like from a wolf's perspective, elk and cow and moose all kind of would be pretty similar. So I feel like it'd be a little bit harder to to control that. Well, from the statistics I read off with the 148 cattle and 208 sheep, it seems like they target kind of all the ranges. But I also want to point out Alaskan wolves versus the lower 48 wolves. Those are two different beasts completely. So I don't know if that evidence can be supported, but from what I understood, Alaskan wolves are much more large game carnivores compared to the lower 48, which are still carnivores, but have no problem catching smaller game. That's what I kind of saw. I'm not sure if it's 100% accurate, but that's just what I I, I kind of saw. I saw, like I said, everything about wolves is controversial. So I did see that, but I did I also saw that they prefer larger game uh, the figure I came across is that each wolf will eat about 12 to 16 cow elk equivalents a year. So about, I think like, is like 600 something pounds of meat, um, is what, what the, they had the cow elk equivalent. So like a bull elk will be more than that. And then your, your calves will be smaller, but it'll about even out to the average weight of a cow elk. And so to me, it just seems like they prefer to eat elk. I mean, they're measuring their intake in elk equivalents. That's probably genetically, right? They are, they're just in their blood to want to chase and kill elk. Yep. Did you see the video of the uh, wolves killing the elk in the Cascades? Is that the one? Uh, is it the one where the elk's trying to plow through the snow? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think I know what video you're talking about. Yeah. So that that's another point that I wanted to bring up is when everyone wants to reintroduce wolves... You know, nature is metal, and I have no problem with that. But my problem is that these same people who are upset that these ranchers are killing their cows in a humane way are okay with some of these cows being killed like that by a bunch of pack of wolves surrounding them, tearing them apart, and that that is, in fact, bad. Or that's okay if it dies like that. But if you just put a little metal spike in its head, air-powered spike, that that's evil. That was something that I was like, all right, come on, like, let's find a balance here between what we believe and how we act. I completely agree with you there, Nick. That that was a bit hypocritical, hypocritical to me, too. Like, oh, you want nature to be completely natural. So you're OK with, you know, uh, some elk and it's like Achilles heel ripped open and it's dragging on and trying to go and go and go until it gets so tired and the wolves just rip it to shreds. But you're not OK with an air pressured bolt into the skull that makes no sense to me so i completely agree with you there there's you can't cherry pick either i mean if anything you should support more how farmers and ranchers do it more than how wolves do it yeah um another thing i wanted to bring up we we're talking about wolves most of this is we're kind of talking about uh, ranchers whose cows r- roam on federal grounds have grazing rights cows and sheep and other livestock but um so I don't know how much you know about this, Mike, but stress level on cows and just like humans has a negative effect, right? The more stressed cows are, they're not going to put in as much muscle and weight and stuff like that. And so they won't be, you know, the thick, juicy cows that, that we want some nice steaks from. So that's another cost that we I haven't really quantified yet, but that's something that people have brought up as a concern. Um, even if the science says that, uh, you know, they're 
not as likely to be killed by wolves as by lions. It seems like the cows don't completely know that yet, and I don't blame them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I agree with you on that statement where the cows probably will pick up the smells and pheromones of wolves and be like, oh, shit, we're not in Kansas anymore. We're in, we're in Colorado. There are wolves now. <laughs> but I want to point this out because I think you'll appreciate this, Nick. So coming across some research from the Carnivore Coexistence Lab at the University of Madison, it shows that killing a gray wolf, This I think this study took place in Michigan, based. Uh, so keep that in mind, it's Michigan wolves, that the wolves that were killed for attacking livestock actually leads to about three more t- three times more livestock attacks. In other words, the wolves retaliate, which I thought was very interesting. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, I was in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and they at the bait shop, and they have uh, shirts up there that look like the Marlboro logo or mar- like a pack of cigarettes. It says Michigan wolves smoke a pack a day. They uh, they don't like wolves up there. <laughs> I mean, I get it, but I don't know if I fully condone it. Because I, I I, know I'm probably on the other side of the board of you, Nick, but from researching this, I see more benefits for wolves than negatives. Now, granted, controlled population wolves, not let them go and let them do natural. I'm talking let them be certain herd size, certain pack size, et cetera, et cetera. But I think we'll get to that later. I want to stick with livestock for a second. Now... With this Proposition 114, like Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, this bill also passes a referendum for the state to give money to any any cattle or livestock loss to direct loss to wolves, which I think is a great idea, but I also realize it's the government politicians, so I don't know how well it's going to be executed. I know in Wyoming, because Wyoming seems to have the most wolves and the biggest wolf issues, has increased their budget, I think, up to 300000 or above 300000 for reprimandums for loss of cattle because of wolves. So there are going to be losses to livestock because of wolves. If And wolves in Colorado are coming. So it it's, I guess, trying to find the balance. Right. That's exactly what... I was led to too it's that it's it's a tidal wave like i don't see wolves not being reintroduced whether people like it or not they're they're coming down and it's how do we live with them and I forget what study it was but there's a study that was done it said the only like the wolves can survive in pretty much any environment and looking at their historical distribution from alaska down to southern mexico we can pretty much say that that's pretty accurate but the number one uh, element or variable that affects if they can survive in an area is how well humans tolerate them. If humans don't like them, we'll get rid of them. I mean, the first bounty that was placed on wolves in uh, North America was like, I forget how much it was, but it was in 1630 in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So from the beginning, we've had it out for wolves. Yeah, I mean, hell, wolves went completely stink- extinct in Colorado in the 1940s. We hunted them down till there were none left wolves have always been something we scare are scared of something we're afraid of something around the campfire when we hear howls at night we get a little closer to the fire wolves have been alongside humanity forever and there's a reason why we're scared of them and there's a reason why they're still around they're really good at surviving by any means necessary and with this 21st century there's a lot of things i don't think we're thinking ahead with wolves introduction the urban environment has grown massively the amount of highways it's it's a new world and i don't know how the old species of wolves will survive in it i hope they do well i hope we manage and control them in a safe environment and i'm for introducing wolves just really small amounts and really extremely monitored if that makes sense just kind of a test run yeah dip your toes in the water yeah like maybe maybe like a non-large sustainable pack maybe just like a medium pack where majority of them wear collars so we can track them exactly just that would be very beneficial to me and i don't know the amount of wolves are gonna be putting into colorado i can't remember off the top of my head 
but I know we've mentioned it before with Yellowstone. Yellowstone currently is under 100 wolves. I think it's like 94, 98 wolves. So under 100. And they've been there first introduced in 1995. And I assume we'll talk about the benefits, especially with wildlife and hunting and kind of keeping that ecosystem going. But for livestock, again, there are going to be losses one way or about it. The question is whether we can mitigate those losses and give the ranchers proper payment for their losses. Yeah, and this is something that this this alone is going to decide the fate of the wolves because if the ranchers don't like the wolves, there's going to be no wolves. So that's pretty much it. They're not going to allow them to come in and fuck up their herds, their income, their life, and these animals that they care for. And if it's going to just not only you know, cause them emotional pain, but also cause their businesses to go under. Uh, like one of, the, I forget exactly the guy's name, but I was listening to him talk, some rancher in Colorado. He said, if a wolves eat enough of our packs and we end up going out of business, there's going to be no habitat left for these wolves to roam on. All these ranches and stuff that people like to look at as they drive through Colorado will turn into condos and wolves can't live in condos. <laughs> Very true. And um, I, there was a, woman i believe she's the president of an agriculture organization i can't quite remember and i apologize but i was listening to her speak and she brought up a very good point i don't know if i agree with this point but it's a good point nonetheless that the government can pay for say the cow is worth twelve hundred dollars can pay that off but they can't pay off the genetic bloodline lost so that cow won't keep passing on his genetics to keep breeding that good bloodline the reason why i don't know if i agree with this is because wolves in general are only successful hunters 20 percent of the time when it comes to large game 80 percent of the time they miss they also have an extremely high tendency to go after weak old or sick species not healthy species Granted, I don't know how isolated species, like a a cow that wanders from the herd, I imagine that's got to significantly change the numbers a bit because if I'm a wolf and I see one kind of linger away, I'm going to go after that one. So that kind of changes it. So a healthy genetic bloodline, I imagine, won't be affected. It's just going to be the sick and the weak and old. You could make the argument that Maybe a cow is sick for a short time, that that's when the wolves get it, even though it's going to come back from the sickness because it's just like a, I don't know, ate something bad and it was just getting over it. That's a fair argument, but I feel like that's going to be far and few in between. How do you feel about that, Nick? Um, so I don't want to get too far away from compensation, but I think that's kind of an unfair statement because cows don't have a good fitness level. So by fitness, I mean how well they survive in an environment. Cows have adapted to living with humans. Cows haven't adapted to living in the backcountry of Colorado. They haven't adapted to running from prey and stuff like that, or running from predators. Their genetic line is more of of uh, docile cows. We want docile cows for the most part. We then we want them to also put on weight, be healthy, and by the time they are old, they're probably in the freezer. So. I don't, I don't think that's something you really worry about with cows. I think the biggest problem for cows is that they're not adapted to living in these environments. You know, it's, it's not really like the cow's been genetically, you know, pressured in this area for so long that it knows to avoid wolves and it's got these great fight or flight instincts. I mean, I've seen cows run from wildfire and as soon as they get over the fence and like five feet away from the fire, they just stand around. They're not, you know, we we bred them to be docile. We haven't bred them to, you know, run at the slightest sense of danger, which these elk and deer have been living their entire lives, fear of something eating them. A lot of these cows, it's not really the case. I can see that argument. I, I also don't want to just solely pick on cows. I can see with wolves in Colorado being more angled towards sheep or goats. I feel like that market's going to hit get hit more than cattle again i'm thinking of how traditionally wolves are this is not always the case but they go after what is what they believe will be a higher success rate and if i'm a wolf and especially if i'm a small pack like how i hope they do it in colorado keep the wolf population small 
healthy and small that they'll go after if they do go after livestock go after sheep and goats now granted i imagine i don't know this that goats and sheep might be either more or less economically stressful if you lose one i think it'd be less i imagine a cow needs more food more time to fully reach its economic value of its highest peak compared to a goat or a sheep. So maybe that will happen, but I have no evidence to support this. I don't know. Again, I want the pack to stay small and and healthy. Yeah, I agree with that. I also I guess, agree that, yeah, sheep's probably, sheep and goats are probably an easier target, um, but we'll see if they, I think maybe just going after elk, going after that bigger game. Uh, in Yellowstone, it seems that they prefer to eat the elk over deer just because maybe it's, you know, you get a bigger meal for more um, more wolves than an elk. And so it's just, to me, I think maybe that'll lead them to cows. But either way, uh, bring them back to compensation because com- be- making it okay with the ranchers is the only way these wolves will survive if that's that's the objective and you have to do that in a fair way but you also can't uh overpay them because then you know the market's bad and oh, oh man all these all these cows just got eaten by wolves <laughs> <laughs> yeah that is true you gotta somehow keep it fair and you know how it is nick them government officials always know how to keep things fair couldn't even say that with a straight face yeah so i think i forget what state it is i think it's wyoming so wyoming if you can find the carcass um if you're having your cows or livestock graze on federal grounds if you can find the carcass and they can prove it's a wolf you'll get the full price of that animal and if it's lost and you can't recover it because you don't know where it is because these these cows, sheep will graze over hundreds of acres, thousands of acres and federal ground and good luck trying to find one carcass in there. And then even better luck trying to get a, fish, a government official way out into the backcountry to verify that that carcass was in fact killed by a wolf. When it's right off the road, that's... It's a little bit easier to get an official out there. But um, so and then if it's found or they just count as a loss, most likely from wolves, they'll give you 50 percent of the value. And it's something, you know, it's but it's like it's got to be a slap in the face. And you're going to lose a certain amount every year, I guess. But I guess I'd rather be paid for a little than just chalk it up as a loss. But it's uh, because of that, the Wyoming ranchers don't tend to have a good view on the wolves so that's why they're the original six wolves in colorado they didn't count that as a sustainable population well one it's six wolves but also because it's on the wyoming border and they figured if it spent too much time in wyoming a few wyoming hunters needed a lucky break and that that pack was gone yeah no i wyoming to me was the one most negatively affected by wolves i don't quite know the legislation for wolf control there from what i can tell it doesn't seem to be that much which i'm i'm not usually for more legislation but for legislation control of wolves in colorado i am kind of for if you're gonna have wolves limit them and i think that's a good compromise between urban and rural but i i two points one i can see where the ranchers are coming from like hey they're fucking with the food on my table for my kids. I'm going to put that wolf down. I get that. Especially if that wolf's a nuisance and keeps doing it again. Again, like I said earlier, killing one wolf who kills your livestock will lead to a three times more effect around that area for uh, killing more livestock. But at the same time, like you said, Nick, getting 50%, getting the full pay for it. The full pay for it because it's direct wolf's wolves, cool. Most likely because of wolves, cool. You can't prove it, but you knew in your heart it's wolves and you don't get paid for it. To me, I know this might sound cold-hearted, but isn't that kind of like the hazards of the job? Like, do you know you're going to lose some of your, some population of your herd to some X amount of reason? Why not? It's, it seems like it's just a hazard of the job. Now, if it keeps happening or it happens to a lot of people in your area, that's a different scenario. But if it happens once in a blue moon, (laughs) moon wolf, uh, if it happens once I don't know, in a while or like a really lean year for deer or uh, elk, it seems more reasonable to me. So uh, again, if wolves are out of control, like they are kind of seem like they are in Wyoming, I get hunting and killing them. But in say Colorado, they keep it small managed and occasionally a cattle gets killed and you can't prove it that it was wolves. 
it, you, even though you kind of knew it is. Again, that just kind of seems like a hazard of the job to me. I don't know if I'm cold here, Nick, or do you disagree with me or agree with me with that? It is a hazard of the job, right? Like, but So hear me out. Yes, loss happens, especially working with nature. Cows, I work with trees. You lose trees to fire. You lose cows if you're running them on ground to, to cats and maybe wolves. That doesn't actually make it the pain any less real. You know, seeing thousands of acres that were planted and knowing the work that's going to get that back to where it should be, <laughs> man, that sucks. Putting all the effort into that cow and then it's gone, you lose that and you lost that income. Now, if you're a giant operation with a ton of head, then yeah, it's not going to have as much an effect. But if you're a small rancher who's only got like 40 head, like a hobby farmer or something, you're smaller than that, that's going to put a huge dent in your operation. So it's one of these things that for all the talk about you know, small businesses and stuff, we really keep pushing people towards and towards big operations and, and large industrial farming by making it harder and harder to be the little guy in the farming ranching world. All right. So two things. One, I'd be okay with a one shot, then kill warning. So like, if you see a wolf coming towards your herd, or you find it eating one of your, or about to attack one of your cattle, or attacking one of your cattle, you get to fire one warning shot, and if they don't fuck off, you get to shoot to kill them. I feel like that's kind of fair for the smaller guy. But th again, this might sound like a dumb question, but is there cattle insurance? Like insurance of for cattle that's lost by tornadoes, trees falling, they trip and fall and break their leg. Is there insurance for livestock? I don't know specifically. I'm Googling it. I know like you can get insurance for your woodlands, but it's really only economically viable if you have a small number of woodlands. If you have a larger number, you can diffuse your risk over your large, larger holding. Um, so I imagine it's probably pretty similar. Um, so yeah, it looks like you can insure your, your cows. And it's just a measure of, I, I don't know if that's for, like if you're a breeding, have a specific breeder cow that's worth a lot of money or just normal joe the farmer cows but you, you can get cattle insurance and maybe that's something that comes out of it and the market takes care of that um, but something that i was thinking about for deterrence so for those of you who don't know most wildlife conservation is paid for by the sale of hunting and fishing tags your hunting fishing licenses and ammo tax on ammo use some of that money to help out help unburden the farmers with the cost of preparing their properties and in uh, property their livestock for a world with wolves and these include a lot of different you know not less than lethal controls um so like barriers electric fences scare devices you know like picture your a modern version of the scarecrow changing your grazing strategies um, the opposite of attractants, like certain smells that the wolves don't like, like you were talking about, guard dogs, or even a human presence with your wolf, with your, uh, your your herd. And it's unfair, I think, to pass the entire cost of this of reintroducing wolves. Just make all the farmers pay for it. But if the state was willing to help these guys bring their operations up to something that can now manage with these wolves, because the problem with some of these less lethal controls to reduce wolves is well they they work in some instances but if you know your neighbor doesn't have it then <laughs> guess what you just got rid of them from your property but now they're on your neighbor's property killing their herd i want to i want to add two things before we get uh, away from it one being i think if the state is choosing to reintroduce wolves they should definitely change or lower the insurance rate for farmers if that happens on their livestock if you are choosing as a state to bring in wolves it's going to affect the ranchers so therefore you should make it easier on the ranchers give them like a tax break or something uh, make their insurance lower due to uh, cattle losses or something like that the other point was my money nick as you mentioned is i actually have some numbers for you the budget for Colorado's reintroduction of wolves is a little less than a million dollars a year. I think it's for nine years, if I remember correctly, which is about... So wait, a million, a million dollars for nine years? A million dollars a year. Oh, okay. Uh, which is less than 0.5% of the budget for Colorado's parks and wildlife on uh, entire budget. To be fair, Colorado is just one big park. Yeah, yeah. 
hippies in the park getting high and and wildlife at Colorado for you. But it seems like that's a if one million dollars is less than 0.5 percent of your yearly budget. Feel like there's a lot of things you could do to help the ranchers and help keep the wolves away from civilization. I feel like if the money is handled responsibly, which history has proven time and time again that government officials will not, but one can hope that they actually don't screw this up. Yep, just put your uh, faith in government there. <laughs> Hence why I live in Texas. Because there's no wolves there? Oh, there's pro- we have so many tigers and lions. I'm not scared of wolves. There's tigers. There, There's a, there's literally tigers about 20 minutes from where I live. No, I, I, I get what you're saying. But, and I personally thought that $1 million seemed kind of low for when you start adding up the... I mean, we'll see what the cost, what the loss is, but it seems like that's not going to... You're, you're going to have to pay all the people for the reintroduction process, and then you're also going to have to pay for the monitoring, and then somehow you're also going to pay all these ranchers, which we'll see how many wolves they reintroduce, but that seems like it's going to be over a million dollars worth of damages per year. I With the damages, I disagree with, because with Wyoming, with has way more wolves, and I would say has... An, I would argue a wolf problem almost. Their budget's only still three hundred thousand dollars for paying damages of cattle or livestock loss to wolves. Granted, but I, also aren't their ranchers extremely unhappy with the amount of money they get paid for wolf deaths? That's what I was about to bring up. I don't know how well the government handles it, so that is definitely a huge asterisk into my point. But I did want to bring that up that the state with, I would argue, the most wolf problem has the a budget of about $300,000. Now, I could also want to play devil's advocate of, yes, the ranchers are the most unhappy, but the wolves aren't even in Colorado yet, and ranchers are already unhappy. So I imagine you're going to be, there's going to be unhappy people no matter what. So I just... Kind of both sides there. Just wanted to point that out. I'm going to let you in on a little secret about farmers and ranchers. We always have something to bitch about, so just keep that in mind. The only time farmers and ranchers are happy is if they're, the price for their crop is, is really, really, really well. They can afford to pay off that new piece of equipment, buy some more head, whatever it is. But for the most part, we like to bitch. People people who work for work the land like to bitch about things. Because it was always better back in my dad's day, and the government's fucking us, and now we have to worry about these wolves, and we can't get the price of, <laughs> the price of wheat so low, and fuck, if I could grow wheat that many bushels, I'd be so fucking happy, I don't know what you're bitching about. Yeah, I've, I've heard it all. Well, I was going to make a joke how rain makes corn, and corn makes whiskey, and whiskey makes my baby fr- frisky, but that just went down a rabbit hole that just kept on going, so moving on. <laughs> and, uh... It, you'll know who you are talking about the so whoever gets ah, grows how many bushels an acre of wheat I'm talking to you so i don't think hunting is gonna be now when i say hunting i mean humans they the amount of amount of meat or confirm how do i say this the amount of success a hunter gets i don't think will be affected by wolves and from and from the evidence, it seems like that's true. The number of elk harvested by hunters has not declined over the past 20 years in Montana, Wyoming, or Idaho, despite the increase of wolves in these states over the past 20 years. Now, I, 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 I disagree, mostly because uh, wolves were reintroduced in Michigan, where a lot of my family goes to hunt, and there's been a definite decline in the deer population since wolf reintroduction. Um also, I think that could be due to the slight, the increase in hunters in the last couple, couple, you know, 20 or so years that there's more people trying to get the same number. So I'd be curious to see that. But anecdotally, I find it hard to believe just as the, when the wolves were reintroduced in Michigan, deer hunting went to shit and we have deers on trail cams or um, wolves on trail cams. So I, I don't know if that's true. Just just it's hard for me to believe, I guess, is what I'm saying. Well, again, I said Montana, Wyoming, Wyoming and Idaho. Not all states treat the wolves the same. Each state's independently. So Michigan could not be 
could be not handling the wolves the best in case scenario. But like I mentioned earlier, hunting by wolves is wolves usually go after the old, weak, or sick herd members. So in fact, from what science has proven and history has proven, that the wolves being alongside these herds might actually make it better for hunters in the long term. With the weak and old and sick being taken out of their herd, the entire herd itself becomes healthier and stronger, less food being wasted going towards stronger and healthier animals, which increases the gene line of healthier animals, which then increases the overall well-being of the herd. And very interesting, a Larry, uh, sorry if I mispronounce your name, Deschardin and a Dr. Matt Holderin made a simulator during COVID to see while the rest of us were making yeast and bread and et cetera, et cetera, they were making a wolf simulator and they wanted to see the effects of hunting on three quote unquote key species already in Colorado. That would be the elk, the deer, and the moose. They did it for a large range of wolves. So one wolf, five wolf, 50 wolf, 100 wolf, 200 wolf, 300 wolf, I think all the way up to like 5,000 or something like that. Very high number. But for 100 wolves, which I thought was the interesting, more interesting number because there's less than 100 wolves in Yellowstone, which is a sustainable, packed, sustainable area. So I'm trying to base it off that. Granted, those are two different scenarios, but it's what I'm working with what I got. For 100 wolves, there would be 5.4% hunting drop-off for elk, 5.3% drop-off for deer, and 7.5% for moose. I, looking at those numbers and seeing the number of sick, old, and, and weak in a herd, all those numbers match except for moose. Moose, I can't explain. I think moose hunting would take a loss with wolves introduced into Colorado, especially if the numbers are around 100. But Well, I think what that is is that there's a, such a small number of moose that the effects are, are felt, whereas with deer and elk, it, it can kind of even out. But there's not that many moose tags. that uh, it, it takes some work to get a moose tag, so there's a smaller population. So variables are, any variable in population is going to be more easily shown, I guess, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I kind of figured population had to do with it, but if 5%, five, I'm just going to say 5% because I don't want to say the decimals, but 5% of uh, deer and elk decrease the hunting because of wolves, it seems like that's not terrible. That's, I would say, negligible on a large scale. But, all, but also, what percentage of hunters kill an elk? I know by me, for... Like open season, only 10% of hunters actually kill an elk. So if you are talking about a 5% loss, that's 50% of the elk are not being harvested. I disagree with that statement because, again, if the herd is getting picked out the weak, old, and sick, then, because I imagine I've never hunted elk, but I imagine for everything else I've hunted, you don't go for the sickly one. You don't go for the old one. You go for the one that looks the juiciest and the one that you want to eat and that's usually the healthiest one so i don't really see that number being affected i i definitely would agree that number will be affected but not by that much what i think i understand that they're going for the the sick ones but i think what they're understating is how often they go for the younger ones the calves are are often targeted which is i think what hunters are concerned about and I do want to bring up a point. Uh, don't get me wrong. Wolves will increase the overall fitness of the elk, which will in turn make it harder to hunt elk. Elk are now have a, another predator on top of humans and cats to compete with, so they're just going to get harder to hunt. People are gonna who want to kill elk will kill elk. It's just I'm worried. I got, I got two points I want to hit, so I'm going to talk about one. We'll come back to the other one, I guess. Uh, uh, Mike, do you know, are you familiar with chronic wasting disease? Yes, actually, I think I researched this. Is it the C? Is it CDW or something? CWD? Yes, that one. Yeah. Yes, I am familiar with it. It started in somewhere in the Midwest. I want to say Wisconsin, moved to Michigan, Illinois. It's a disease that's in cervids, so deer, elk. Not that there's elk in the Midwest, but it's been spreading across the nation. It spreads in the deer's, uh, oh my gosh, I can never think of the feces, the correct term to say. And it stays in the ground, and then if it, or and piss, not that that's the right term either, but stays in the ground wherever the 
animal excrement is. And then if there's grass there, another deer eats it, it spreads to that deer, gets in the brain. Deer, wolves may be one step in helping to get rid of it because... Like you said, hunters don't want to kill that sickly deer. Well, wolves do. And when this was just a small problem in one state, people, some people want to stop it, said the only way to stop it is a cull because deer keep spreading it. So they had an aggressive hunting campaign. It got outside the boundary and they just kept expanding it, but government was too slow, as usual. And now it's spreading across the United States. But wolves should have a negligible or have a positive impact because they are targeting, like you said, these these weakened deer. If a wolf eats a deer with CWD, chronic wasting disease, it can sp spread that CWD in its shit, but it's not going to continue to spread it once it gets all that deer out of its system. Um, but like you said, it's going to go after those deer that the uh, hunters wouldn't go after. And last I checked, it is still safe to eat CWD deer for hunters. It's just, uh, it's a, it's a brain disease. A, a, not ideal. Uh, no, it, it's, um, not, not that it's, it's just people, hunters don't want to eat an animal that looks sick. You know, humans don't want to eat an animal that looks sickly just evolution wise. I, I imagine. Yeah. And to add on to that, I actually did a little research on the CWD. Actually, did you know mouth lions are have a higher percentage chance of passing it than wolves do? Of uh, of passing it on in their stool? Or yes. Okay. Same with bears too. Wolves are actually lower on the predatory scale of pa spreading CWD. Yeah. So they're like, I'm not trying to to just shit on wolves here. They do play an important role. Um, but I think so. Th the the other point I was trying to make, or not trying to, I just started making it now. Like I mentioned previously, most conservation efforts are paid for through hunting, fishing, ammo sales. With the increase in wolf population, yes, you'll see more a more fit elk, deer, prey population. But I think you'll see less hunters because as there's even more pressure on these animals now. And with less pressure, the state's going to get less money from their fish and wildlife funds, which means less money to manage and do all the stuff that they want to do. And that's what's got me worried, is that a declining hunting fishing population leads to a decline in conservation dollars, which leads to less management for all these things, so things could get out of hand. Now, another way to offset that is, uh, and if I'm getting ahead, Mike, we can go back to some other stuff, but I think would be raising the tags of the wolf hunts, because I think humans want to kill wolves whether it be hunters who want to get some revenge or but predominantly people who have a big pocketbook who can afford to pay 25 grand for a tag like they do for certain species are going to pay that to hunt these certain species at certain times and and all this stuff and if the wolf population is kept low like you talk about it's going to need to be thin there's going to be need to be some kind of lethal control and if we lose revenue from the sale of tags because there's less deer and elk for people to hunt. We're going to have to get that revenue back somehow to con ma continue managing at the level that we are now. And allowing people to hunt those same wolves would be a way to do that. Oh, I completely agree. agree. I definitely believe, depending on the season and the trend of the populations, we should definitely have tags for wolves. That just, to me, is common sense. But that's a little bit ahead. I actually still want to talk about the hunters, if that's all right, before we get into hunting. No, nope, that's good. I I kind of knew I was jumping ahead there, but that's where my train of thought led me. So let's jump on back. So the uh, two major points. One, it comes back to trees and plants, Nick, which I I can't escape it. No matter what episode we do, it always comes back to trees and plants. Remember when Mars came back to plants? <laughs> Oh, I was, I really wish you could saw my face because I was just downing my glass of whiskey at that point. But another great thing about wolves helping keep the herds and size down is what you've been bringing up, Nick, of the animals a little bit more twitchy. They are a little more hyper-focused, moving around a little bit more. They don't herd in the same area as much. They keep moving, which could be beneficial extremely to plant and the environment not only would perhaps more native species get spread around through manure of you know the elk eats so-and-so grass and or eats so-and-so berries helps plant their that around granted it could also be the same for invasive species but the elk deer mooses won't over graze a field they'll be like oh shit wolves might be nearby let's go so you won't have these 
decimate areas. They won't get destroyed. They'll constantly keep moving, which means more plant life, which means more diversity, which means also the diversity that we want in plants gets spread to where we want, the same areas that we want. And I can see that being a great point to have, to keep the herds moving naturally, wolves. Because I don't know about you, Nick, but you never run faster than you are when you're scared. Definitely true. And that's, yeah, it's another thing. I've, uh, talking about predators and, and wolves is why I don't know where I stand on them, is I've never felt more alive than when I f- am facing some kind of predator in the wild and all my senses are heightened. But that doesn't always end well, and I don't know if I want to put that on other people. But definitely, I... I so what you're... We're going to talk about this real quick. In, in Yellowstone, there is no hunting, right? So these deer and elk, they don't have predators. So there's nothing pushing them away from these these big grasslands, these prairies where they're hanging out. Because there's if you're worried about a predator, you're not going to hang out in the open. It's, it's just not going to happen. You're, you'll go down there to feed when you have to, but you'll hang out in areas where you have an escape route, a better place to go where you can see people coming in. And because of that, they've been pushed off these bottomlands, these grasslands, these riverside or stream banks, and the vegetation there is allowed to recover, which is true. And I think what's I think it's overstated the effect that wolf reintroduction will have on vegetation outside of the park because of hunting pressure already keeps these animals moving. Like I said, in the park, they have no predators, but outside, they still have the predators of man. Now, they have cats in the park, sure, but they're more... So yep. I I agree, but I also want to add the caveat of there are hunting seasons. Wolves don't have a hunting season. They'll keep those elk moving year-round, and I think that might change things. That's true. I mean, hunting season is... I mean, the time a human could kill an elk, at least in Oregon, is, is like something like six months when you combine archery, muzzleloader, and rifle season. It's a long period of time. But yes, and also one of the things that I would say is where they're doing that as well. You know, most hunters are only going to go a mile at most from their vehicle. Even more fewer hunters will go six miles, and even fewer hunters will go over 10 miles into the backcountry. That's the area where you know wolves will probably do do their do their best and, and restore those environments where there is almost no hunting pressure. Like probably in the Frank Church wilderness, where I mean it's only what like freaking half the state of Idaho is one is one is a wilderness area. That means there's no roads through it or anything. There's a lot of land in there that isn't pressured at all. I mean there's probably cats and stuff in there, but wolves may get those deer elk moving around a little bit more. I completely agree. And and this is this is kind of where I come in, right? Where I I don't I don't know exactly where I stand because wolves definitely will have a positive impact in those places. But wolves have been shown to travel over a thousand miles from where their main uh, their what's in their pack range is usually over two hundred miles. But if they're looking for a mate or they get pushed out, they'll travel over a thousand miles to find a new mate or a pack. And so you never know where they're going to end up. So it's hard to say where they're going to stay. It would be perfect, right? If they're going to stay in their little backcountry place where the hunters don't go. And then the hunters and wolves can work together to keep the cervid, uh, the deer and elk population under control. It'd be great if you go up to a wolf and go, sit, stay. <laughs> but unfortunately, we can't. But Nick, this might be a little bit sidebar. Obviously, you've hunted. I've hunted. I've never come across anyone who's hunted with a muzzle loader. Have you? Yeah, I've come across a few people. Have they? I kind of want to get into it. Gotten anything? Yeah. Um. Actually, yeah, they've gotten stuff. But uh, I don't know if you've have heard this. One of the biggest problems with muzzle loaders is if the like your uh, primer, the thing on the outside of the gun will go percussion cap. Sure, will go off, but the the powder on the inside won't go off. And so it's not uncommon for muzzle loaders to have a like a sight on an animal, pull the trigger, your powder goes or your part on the outside of the gun goes bang, makes a spark, and then your powder doesn't go off. And so then you have to sit there after the animal hears that click, you gotta take your your ball and powder out, put 
new dry powder in and ball in hopefully before the animal gets away but i think it might be more common out here actually my cousin does it in the up but I, yeah I, i've run across a few people i kind of want a muzzle loader just because well this is america i don't have to justify that <laughs> <laughs> i'm not gonna lie i want muzzle loader too i don't care if i hunt with it i just want to shoot one and have one but all right so bringing it back one, you mentioned Yellowstone, which I want to bring up again because, yes, the has been beneficial for Yellowstone. There's no argument about that. The elk population has gone down but has steadied off to a good number. There are not as many elk starving to death anymore. Also, the bison population increased probably because the elk aren't eating all the fields. But again, just because it worked in Yellowstone doesn't mean it's going to work elsewhere. That being said, with Colorado and Proposition 114, Wolves help other species, not just plants grazing, not just keeping herds, you know, healthy. Wolves, again, specifically in Colorado, will help scavenger species like wolverines and eagles. Those species who kind of follow wolves. I mean, wolves and ravens have always had a symbiotic relationship. They, there's lone wolves and lone ravens that would hunt together. I think they, that still happens today. And with you know endangered species like wolverines that might be beneficial might do a little evil of lose some livestock lose some possible game for the hunters but other species help flourish because they're scavenging they're following the wolves they're helping increase the population they would also wolves in colorado help keep the coyote population down which to me is a big talking point for against re introducing uh, wolves is the loss of pets but i would make the argument in reality coyotes kill more pets than wolves granted like nigga mentioned earlier there are a lot less wolves than they are coyotes so that number could be askew and take all this with the coyotes for grain of salt because i i hate coyotes so more more coyotes gone the better in my opinion so i might be a bit biased on that but nick my question is to you if all these species can be helped by wolves the herds being thinned to a healthy healthy herd the wolverines and eagles being brought back up and coyotes which have a tendency to roam into suburbs and cities and urban areas maybe get thinned out so they don't have to do that or they might increase and go into more city and urban areas but overall how do you feel about other animals being positively or negatively affected by wolves and and by animals i mean wild animals i'm not talking livestock I'm solely talking wild animals. Okay. Let me, I have one quick thing to say before that I get to your question. I just remembered I wanted to say, kind of going back to the livestock one, is not all livestock or people in agriculture are against wolves. There's some people who grow like crops who are pro wolves because they want to get rid of elk and deer degradation on their crops. Deer and elk eat whatever you're growing and, you know, they eat plants, so they have a negative impact. Um, so there are some people on, on the rural side who are very pro-wolves, for, for that matter. And completely agree, Mike, that yes, the wool, the impact the wolves will make for a more complete ecosystem, right? Because this kind of, oh man, I forgot when we were talking about it. I think this is back in um, probably uh, reintroducing mammoths. Um, you don't know how everything interacts in the ecosystem until something is gone. So you don't know what bringing back the wolves will bring, right? I mean, we can we can guess. The wolves is a pretty big, it's an apex predator. We know kind of how it's going to affect, but it's those, as you scale down, like Mike, you mentioned the scavengers that are going to be helped by the wolves. And this this is the moral question that, that I struggle with. I know what is right, like what is right by the planet in, in the ecosystem and nature is to bring the wolves back. The wolves were here before us morally, it's our duty to help them bring come back and thrive in the environment they're from. Not not debating that. Like I think that's true. But I also don't it's also hard for me to say, you know, morally, I shouldn't kill my neighbor's cows. So I'm kind of, like this is the impasse that I'm at, right? Like there's there's good and bad. And so what's worse and what's what's better? As a whole, it's probably better to bring wolves back because like you said, and I I don't disagree with you, Wolves are going to help not not just the deer and elk populations become more fit, and by fit, I mean fitness, ability to survive in their environment. They're going to get rid of the old, the weak. You're going to have a better gene pool because of it. And if there's, I mean, and genetics is the basis of everything. And as that scales down, like Mike said, it's going to help all these scavengers. 
like wolverines, wolverines, all these things that are going to also feed on these animals, even bears. You know, it's not uncommon to see um, wolves and bears feeding on the same carcass if there's an abundance. So, yes, I think wolves are a net good for the environment, the ecosystem, for sure. I don't think that's that's really a question. No, I get completely what you're saying is, yeah, it's, to me, how I look at it is, whether we like it or not, humanity is are the caretakers of this Garden of Eden that we call Earth. We are, it's our responsibility to take care of it, especially when we hunt a species to extinction. It's kind of our job to, we might have to bring them back, might not bring them back, but at least make it balanced, a yin and a yang. But I don't want to be that asshole who causes my neighbor down the road to lose their entire herd. That, well, I would feel like an asshole. So I get where you're coming from. And again, I think it's it comes down to moderation with how many wolves or like having a small number of wolves. Because what wolves used to be can't happen again. The planet is too different. So we need to adapt the number and range for these wolves to fit into this new century. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I think it's the only scenario we can move forward with. But Nick, perhaps I can help sweeten the deal. Because we've thought about it before, an invasive species, which you could definitely go check out in Backyard Philosophy on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. But feral pigs. Colorado opened up season to get rid of feral pigs and it worked out for them well it might be a good long-term plan to keep wolves around so if a feral pig shows up those wolves tear out that some bitch pigs out heart out so the, the wolf might get the three little pigs if we if we're smart and, and think about this and plant everything out we could use wolves to help keep out invasive species i do like that uh, yeah uh, I, I didn't even think of that or run across that did you st- did you specifically see anything about if wolves will go after pigs? Nope. I just thought of it, and I figured if I'm a wolf, I mean, wolves have been going after boars in Europe, so I imagine wolves in America would go after feral pigs. I don't have any evidence to support this. To me, it just makes logical sense, and I would suspect that perhaps feral pigs won't venture into that state like they smell predator species because i'm not quite certain and i have i off the top of my head i, I can't remember any evidence that backs this up but i rem, if i remember correctly mountain lions how they scent their territories different than wolves and it makes it harder for some prey to smell mountain lions than it is for wolves i could be mistaken on that could be making out making it up pulling it out of my ass but remember correctly their scents are different for prey species so maybe wolves just the scents alone even if it's a small pack might keep out feral pigs from venturing north or ruining more farmland i don't know if if the scent would keep them out but i can imagine i i am curious of what it would do if we drop like a i mean they're not going to race waste a red wolf on that but if you drop some of the like arizona wolves and just one wolf in texas kind of see how they interact with the pigs and if it turns out it's wholesale slaughter like sign let's go boys let's go get the forget the hunting dogs let's go get the wolves right don't they use like pit bulls and armor to chase to kill uh kill the pigs and yeah are you familiar with bear neck uh bear and wolf uh necklaces and collars for dogs uh yes yeah they kind of modified that to go after feral pigs so that because like i've seen some people put kevlar vests like uh for like bomb dogs on their dogs because the feral hogs they're they're they grow tusks even the female grow tusks so they want to protect them from getting the dogs from getting hit so they put dogs in body armor to go after them and they use everything rottweilers pit bulls i mean i i i say throw everything in the book at them too because feral hogs are a nuisance and we need to get that under control asap yeah so that that would be interesting i I would like to see like um uh, anchorman he's like i have an idea for a tv show we release a bunch of uh, chickens into the studio and a lion and we just call it let her rip (laughs) (laughs) i'd love to see uh pig versus wolf (laughs) i do pay-per-view for that (laughs) i'm trying to think what the betting odds are for that I, I think you'd have to even it out, maybe like seven pigs like, to one wolf. I don't know. I feel like it could be pretty even, a wolf and a pig. Uh 
I don't know. Just one wolf, because wolves, their primary, they're, they're dangerous because they hunt in packs. So one wolf versus one pig, that would actually be a challenge. A couple wolves versus a pig is nothing. That's fair. That's fair. Oh, I think this is very important before we move on to the next subject piece. Wolves have been known in the past to be not serial killers, but frantic killers. Like they kill, they kill for fun. This is far and few in between. I get this is usually very north, like Arctic Circle north. This is very, very rare in in Canada and in the United States that that actually happens so that is a point i want to point out so that can address that fears that's probably not going to happen and again wolves attacking people we discussed that earlier that is kind of evidence yet to be seen but nick i want to talk about a point i am most scared about about reintroducing wolves wait are you, is it that the price of the pay-per-view is going to be too high hell no we're gonna legally stream that let's, let's no, okay let's be honest <laughs> No, my, unless you have anything more with hunting. Nope, I'm good with hunting. This kind of ties everything together. This ties in hunting, livestock, and landscape. Wolves have the capacity to change rivers. Now, you might think, oh, well, Mike's gone crazy again. No. When wolves were gone from uh, Yellowstone Park, beavers ram ramped it. They blocked up dams. They changed the landscape. They flooded areas. They dried up areas. And then wolves came back. They fucked up the beavers. Water went back to how it used to be when beavers were a normal population. With wolves, though, wolves will affect how the herd moves, which means it will affect the streams because the herd has to drink from streams, and they might not drink from the same stream constantly, so the environment might change. So the herd might stay there usually for a couple of weeks, but all of a sudden they, can't, they, can, they have to move after one week to a different spot. And based on the rains of the season, based on how the snow melts, there might not be a lot of water there, which causes drought, which means if there's drought, the elk might cross the stream, might cross the river, creating a trout. Now, this is going to take years, but I'm worried that wolves will cause herds to change the dynamic of the landscape, and change the rivers, change the lakes. And that could be very dangerous. might flood people's homes, and going back to livestock— a lot of people depend on the rivers, and if a herd changes a river's direction, that herd might ruin it for the entire livestock to get water. That far, that rancher might have to ask his neighbor to go across his land. The rancher might have to spend extra days to get to water, etc., etc., etc. That is perhaps my biggest concern with introducing wolves: is how it's going to change the physical environment. Now, Nick. I don't know if you thought about this or if maybe I'm just crazy, but perhaps you could give me your opinion on it. I think this kind of all ties back into the Yellowstone thing. I think most of the herds are used to moving around. So I, I really think the effect of wolves on the landscape is kind of exaggerated um, just because most of the studies are done in Yellowstone where there is no hunting pressure. So these animals don't move around. Yes, in that area, there was a drastic change when wolves came back. Rivers flow differently, herds move different ways. At the same time, like um, I, one of my, the biggest themes I, I try and relate to people, just talking about my job of, of growing trees, is that nature is dynamic. Nature's not static. So, what could be changed by wolves could just as easily be changed by a slide, uh, some kind of landslide, a mass soil movement changes the flow of the river. Nature's constantly changing. The environment's constantly changing. Things are moving or back and forth. It's a give and a take. There's so many variables that go into it. If rivers do decide to flow differently or or tributaries dry up or, or something, that's it is something that happens uh, for a variety of reasons. And adding one more reason I don't think is going to have a huge effect. I, I think if you deal with nature long enough you get used to the shit that it throws at you now not saying that that's not going to be terrible like losing access to water is <laughs> it could be the end of it for for certain operations especially in colorado where they're seeing a drought shortage and they're doing a lot of different experiments with their forestry to kind of keep more water or keep snow pack longer to keep more water 
in the mountains as a reserve or in their reservoir. So when it flows down into town at different times and the state might come looking for some of these people's water anyway. So I think water is quickly becoming a scarce commodity just because of the times we're living in and the population we have. And wolves may make that, they may ex exacerbate that problem, but I don't know if they'll be the sole contributor to that problem. But I understand the concern. Uh, again, I didn't quite think it the same as you. I kept thinking it how we're in a different century and the world is very different from when wolves were in Colorado. So having waters change might affect people's lives, homes, and I'm really concerned about for the ranchers of having that water source. That that makes or breaks everything. The farmers need water for the crops. The ranchers need water for their for their livestock. Nothing can survive without water. So when you start messing with that, I always get a little nervous. Yep, and uh, we'll have to do a whole thing on water rights later on. But yes, water is is I mean it's as much as I like to say soil is the most important thing. Mike always corrects me saying, well, you can't have anything without water. And technically he's right. Some, some, some quality H2O. Technically he's right. You, you mean from the toilet? <laughs> <laughs> oh, water boy and interocracy. How great movies. But Nick, I want to bring it back to what you said, because I think this is a good point to have it of, well, if the water starts to get changed or livestock gets munched on too much or the herd is getting thin too much, it's time to open season on wolves. I agree with you of controlling the wolf population is extremely important. And I think we should have tags, especially if like there's a, like a lean hunting season and we need money to help keep the ecosystem going based on, you know, park rangers conservationists helping other animals etc cetera, etc cetera. and granted we haven't talked about it but tourism i think would be extremely beneficial because of wolves but let's start with hunting with tags for wolves i agree with it especially if the population calls for it and i imagine nick you also have to agree with it so i definitely agree i think hunting is an important part and um a point i ran into listening to uh the meat eater podcast which is a hunting podcast they're talking about how hunters are actually the ones who set it up set everything up for the reintroduction of wolves hunters did such a good job bringing the deer and elk population back up to above what it's supposed to be that now we have to bring talking about bringing another predator to control that deer and elk population so we kind of hunters shot we set, we shot ourselves in the foot on this one they shot themselves in the foot <laughs> so th this this is why you don't go above and beyond guys you, you stay around that sea level <laughs> no i Definitely can see that. And I'm hoping it goes to tags of that because an another major concern of mine is poaching. I hate poachers, and I think it'd be awful for wolves that just got reintroduced to an area to get poached. Yeah, and so like um, that, that same podcaster talking to the fish and game guys, and yeah, you have, like I talked about in, in Michigan, the smoke a pack a day. If you don't pay the ranchers enough to uh, offset the cost of the wolves, uh, phrases that you hear commonly in, in the Upper Peninsula are just shoot them in the gut or don't shoot them on your own property. Just, things just kill them, but don't get caught is essentially what, what they talk about. So if, if you can't fairly compensate these people, they're going to be poached. <laughs> this is how we got here to have to reintroduce them is that they fuck with livestock and that's how people make money and food. And in the past, we decided that it wasn't worth it enough. So now, okay, we're there's, I think talking about tags, Mike, I yep. Okay, I I be, before 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 you get into that, um, I just want to point out poaching in my mind is simply hunting an animal for one that's not tagged or during season, and for personal gain, like like their pelt or their antlers or something like that. Poaching, what you just described for they keep killing my livestock, to me isn't poaching that's just defending your property so i just want to make that distinction before you go th th forward sorry yeah doesn't that actually probably doesn't hold up in a court of law mike but i appreciate the sentiment <laughs> it matters to me god damn it <laughs> um but yeah so okay tags uh for those people who, who 
haven't hunted or don't know much about hunting, you buy your license, your hunting license, you, you take your hunt, hunter's ed course, so you know about gun safety and, and stuff like that. Your tag, you buy a tag per species, depending on when you, on uh, what you're hunting with, archery or bow or or same thing, archery or rifle or muzzleloader, it's con and time of season, it could be a different time, where you're hunting, what tag you put in for, you may or may not get your tag. Uh, it, it's kind of a, yeah, it's, it happens though, it, it's kind of a long process, but you get points so you might get it next year. It's not a sure thing, tags, for depending on the area you put in for. So just, just to be just kind of explain that a little bit. Now I think the wolf tags are going to be one of two things. You're going to have your degradation tags. And these are the tags that uh, the farmers, ranchers are going to get. If you own over a certain amount of acres and you have a certain amount of degradation, you're going to get a tag to kill, depending on how fishing game does it, one or two wolves, whatever it is. And then you're going to get the tags that hunters pay for. Now, initially, these tags are going to be worth a lot of money. Uh, probably close, I mean, depends where you're at, right? As the species is just getting established in Colorado, these will probably be like the cost of a sheep tag. You know, you could put in for it and get lucky and pay a small amount after year after year. I mean, I think it takes like 20, 30 years if you keep putting in every year to get a sheep tag. It's like 12 years for an antelope tag. And then, um, but you could do like a raffle. So all these states have raffles uh, for like silent auction and stuff for these big donors. And you can pay like 25, 30 grand for this tag in some kind of raffle or, or silent auction. And all that money goes straight back into conservation. So I get everyone saying, well, that's unfair. Okay, yes, you know, people can just buy their tags. But at the same time, that's 25 grand from one person to kill one animal going straight back into conservation helping every single population in that state not saying that fish and wildlife is like a plus plus on spending their money but it's not going to the governor to do some bullshit thing right this is going back into fish and wildlife this is where hunters and anglers want that money to be and i think it's gonna be the same thing with wolves initially it's gonna be you know you're gonna have to have a lot of money to hunt wolves but eventually it'll open up to everyone else which it kind of has in idaho and other places like that where you can hunt wolves yeah it's probably an expensive tag but relative to some other places not the most money you'll ever spend on a tag and that money is all going to be put back into conservation and in montana yes in montana they were trying to introduce a bill it got turned down where when you buy your fish and game tag you can opt to help offset the cost of the wolves so you can pay a certain amount of money and that money ends up going to reimburse the ranchers and stuff like that so you have money coming in for hunting. These wolves are generating revenue, and that revenue can and probably should be used to offset the cost of them being in the ecosystem. Now, we know they are going to improve the ecosystem as a whole, but we do have to offset the economic cost of them being in the ecosystem to those ranchers. And I think the tags from the wolves going to help offset the cost of those ranchers is probably one of the best ways to do it. I agree. I also would say that part of that money goes into controlling the wolves so it doesn't have to affect the ranchers at all. And hopefully, because I can see this, I, I see this as a cash cow. <laughs> uh, sorry, pun there. Just ignored it. Tourism could also be a huge revenue, port, huge revenue part to help pay for the wolves, whether it be they affect livestock or just keeping them together or studying them, et cetera, et cetera. Because wolves in the new ecosystem means universities, means fat American tourists want to go there in their sandals who just came from a city. It means that some families and some kid is fascinated with wolves, really wants to see a wolf, and their parents bring them to see a wolf. Makes the kids year, decade just to see a live wolf. And that could mean a lot of money, like so Cow, not, what's a safari called that's not in africa uh, i think it's a safari i don't know wildlife viewing we we should have we should have different names for different regions of climate and temperature because i could imagine it'd be very easy to have a exploration of seeing kind of fall like maybe you spent maybe you spend a couple thousand dollars and for a week you follow these wolves safely from a distance and watch them take down predators or i don't know some photography or uh, other stuff 
I feel like tourism and tags alone could generate enough money to cover all the bases. Ecotourism is the word you're looking for. Sure. We'll go with ecotourism. Tor- terrorism. <laughs> Not terrorism. Tourism. <laughs> Two different things. I'm glad you cleared that up, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I I have no idea how my own brain works sometimes. Yeah, I I agree and disagree. I I think tourism is a part, but I think I just don't see the revenue generated from tourism that I do from from hunting. Oh, I'm not I'm not and, and I'm not saying that they're equal. Part of I'm it is both to- and tourism. Money. Yeah, agreed. And part of the reason is uh, tourism is like a trigger word for the rural people. Like. <laughs> Everyone's like, well, why don't we just stop being a logging economy and just focus on tourism? It's like, well, because tourism only supplies jobs for 25, a third of the year. But so it's it, the words thrown around a lot. And it usually means in the fact that someone's losing their job. Um, not that that's what this means in this particular case, but it's just like it's got that image attached to it. So people don't like it. But definitely like a lot of people go to Yellowstone and, and people do like wolves. Even the ranchers who have had, who have learned to live with wolves. And it's a, th- right, it, it kind of comes down to people don't like change. A lot of ranchers who get uh, questioned or surveyed after wolves are in their habitat, they'll say things like, predom- one of the predominant answers is, I don't like that the wolves are here in relation to my business, but I do like being able to see them and hear and being able to hear them at night because it it is cool like it is cool or something like people like wolves i mean humans we are enamored with wolves right how many stories do we have about wolves so there's something about wolves that attracts us to them i mean man is dog's best friend right and they're descended from wolves so we do have a, a very real connection to these animals so and which I think makes it hard for people to, like I said, especially for me, I want wolves to be in the landscape. I want the ecosystem to be as wild as it can be. But I, I have a hard time reconciling that certain people are going to have be affected larger than other people, which is my my concern. Obviously, from a moral level, I want wolves to be here, right? Like that's not, I'm 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 not against that. It's just the effect that they have. I don't know if that's something that I can. I can push off onto someone else, you know, like I don't actually have to pay for the cost of wolves. I know they're good. I think, I think both sides have merits. I just, this numbers, if done properly, again, I can't stress this enough, small population of wolves in an area and maintained is extremely beneficial. As soon as wolves get out of control, like how I feel like they are in Wyoming, something needs to get done. It's small controlled means good for everyone anything above that it means bad news for the ranchers at least at least that's how i see it i i agree and this is a point that um they talked about in the mediator podcast that i kind of want to bring up or expand upon so they talked about how so i'm gonna preface this with ranchers feel like they're not listened to and environmentalists feel like they're not listened to so you got the the far one side and the far the other side, and both sides feel like they're not being listened to. In the middle, you got Fish and Game, who they're they're doing their best, but you can't please both these populations at the same time, right? Yeah, unfortunately, you can't. The ranchers feel like they're being burdened with this more so than other people, and on the the environmentalist, they are, and and in, in, in my mind, they are being the most have directly affected is the ranchers exactly no i i agree and the environmentalists are upset that people are allowed to kill wolves now like we talked about mike you and me both we're we're fine with people killing wolves when they reach a certain point where they can survive and we can kill wolves generate revenue you need to control the population otherwise it's going to destroy other populations you keep everything in check you're going to have a better ecosystem and they were talking about how the wolves have a good chance of becoming another northern spotted owl and for those of you who aren't familiar with the timber wars the northern spotted owl is a symbol of environmentalist versus loggers of the sh- the kind of the end of the golden days of logging the beginning of the over the regulation of forestry and kind of the the end of uh logging companies being able to do what they want now i'm not saying which side is right or wrong per- me personally i think it was an overcorrection i think as new science came out like now like 
30, 40 years later, we should be able to go back and adjust things. But we've already we've already put our foot in the sand. But that northern spotted owl is not seen as a northern spotted owl. That animal is seen as the division between urban and rural. It is seen every time someone sees one, it reminds them of the time their economies were destroyed, the time jobs were lost. It's it's not an an animal, right? It's not seen as an animal. It's seen as destruction of economy. It's a symbol of something more. And listening to some of the more environmentally minded podcasts or, or people on YouTube talking about their views, they're very upset that people are allowed to hunt wolves and they want to get the feds involved to make it so people can't do that. And I think if that happens, that's, again, another overcorrection. And looking back now at the Northern Spotted Owl thing, we can see that logging companies were, you know, over harvesting. They're getting too close to stream banks, stuff like that. But at the same time, the whole movement was about the Northern Spotted Owl, which in fact wasn't losing population because of habitat loss, is losing habit uh, losing population due to a more efficient predator because of climate change moving north. And we adjusted our entire economy or logging because of that. And because of that's been a symbol of this divide. And if the environmental movement who has, I'd say they have the, the high ground, they have the pressure, wolves got reintroduced, they're on the, the offense and they're trying to move more and more. If they make it so that people can't kill these wolves, can't control the population, take it out of the hands of fish and game, like in California, the uh, mountain lion population, they were endangered. So the legislature took it, made in the legislature, you couldn't hunt them. 20 years go by, now there's an abundance of them. But it's California, so the legislature is never going to take them off the no hunting list. So you just have all this degradation of animals. It's hard because of an overpopulation of predators. And I could see this going the same way. But we got to get these environmentalists and these ranchers to find a middle ground, right? These these people, you know, the ranchers, hunters want to kill some of these wolves, and the environmentalists don't want to kill any, and that's not going to work. And the environmentalists are trying to get the feds involved and. Personally, I, I think this should be under the fish and game. Like I said, with California, with uh, their mountain lions, that went under the protection of the legislature for California. They took all the power away from fish and game, which that's actually like their job. You know, people aren't elected to the legislature because they have a background in managing wildlife. Same thing. We I think the ballot measure of saying we want wolves reintroduced is a message to fish and game to say we want wolves reintroduced now let's let them do what they're gonna do because fish and game i mean that's that's what they're there for right that's their job they know this better than we do and i'm not saying that we need to trust the government at all but what i am saying is i know a lot of people who went to work in fishing game if there's one thing they want it is wildlife back on the land and it, we got to watch them right because that's what people do they watch their government make sure they're not going one way or the other but i can very i'm, I'm just concerned for the future of it looks like another case, uh, to me personally, coming from the rural side, it looks like another case of environmentalist overreaching their boundary and then the wolves will be become not just an animal, but become another example of urban viewpoints being imposed on a rural life. So one, a couple things. One being checks and balances. All <laughs> There's a reason why our forefathers brought that into checks and balances. Super important. Making sure compromise, you know, make sure everyone's kind of happy. If no one's if no one's super happy, it's kind of the right decision because that means all their bases are kind of covered. Two, every time you kept saying like symbol and like killing, I don't know why, but I pictured you as a forester joker. And now I kind of want like a midnight summer's dream slash lumberjack joker slash batman thing to happen don't really know why so do i just like plant trees in people's like backyards or what what do i do as forester joker well i, I was thinking more chainsaws axes and just that kind of theme it, like you go up to like a like a like a person chained to a tree like cut down the trees and they're chained up and they're locked and they can't move anywhere and you start changing your chainsaw and you see their panic and go why are you so serious like do you want to know the uh the best environmentalist story oh i have sure so my boss uh in idaho uh his first name brian not gonna give the last name uh he was going out to with the logging crew to cut down some trees because that's what logging crews do 
and they replant later don't worry just like every industrial forest owner but uh this this environmentalist had chained himself to the gate so brian gets out of the truck he looks at him he looks at the gate he opens the gate pushes the environmentalist who is currently <laughs> chained to the gate he didn't chain the gate shut he was just chained to the gate <laughs> so he opened the gate drove the truck through closed the gate again went back cut down their trees you know did, did their job for the day came back guy was still there opened the gate again pushed him to the side drove out closed the gate again left for the day <laughs> that that needs to be a comedy skit right there oh but my last thing that you brought up when you were explaining your point of again the very possible real possibility that wolves can become a symbol much like the spotted isle for some reason in my mind i kept thinking like the apocalypse was going to happen and i think how funny it would be to reintroduce wolves to an area and all of a sudden the population happens so now you have to deal with looters riders and wolves well some of those uh, might sort each other out <laughs> my money's on the wolves <laughs> we're having another pay-per-view i know who i'm betting on for that one yeah uh this is uh i think i think this is part of a larger picture of what's happening in the united states is mankind or the united states coming to terms of of what is natural and what nature is and how nature interacts right like kind of we talked about this on wildfire a little bit of like wildfire it's a good thing for the environment right it can be in in certain amounts not talking about devastating middle of summer wildfires but humans don't like it right like we we like things controlled we don't like these out of control wildfires even though it is what we get from the things that we have done it's like we put in a and b and we get c and we're all pissed off it's it's the same thing we're trying to remedy that like remedy our mistakes by bringing these wolves because we got rid of them. And to me, it seems like it falls under this broader brush of just things you've been talking about. Like, like I said, wildfire, wolves, reintroducing species, all this stuff is like we're turning the page and rectifying the mistakes of, of humans in the past. Yes, I'm hoping we're not trying to atone for our past mistakes, but simply trying to learn from them. I think those are two very different categories, and I'm very hope I'm very hopeful, but still very wary that we with wolves we might be able to do that. Again, the world's so different from when wolves were run out of town. What we we can't bring it back to what it was. Doesn't mean we can't bring it back to a balance that is comfortable for both sides. Yeah, and I want to stress again the study that wolves can survive pretty much anywhere the only thing affecting whether they will succeed or not is if humans who live in that area can tolerate them so we need to make it so that all of these humans who are affected by wolves can tolerate them whether it be financial assistance helping them upgrade their operations to better protect against wolves or something but we can't just introduce wolves and leave the rest of us the rest of these guys hanging high and dry it needs to be a quote-unquote team effort we got to protect our people because if they don't like the wolves they will just kill the wolves and again i i can't blame them personally because humans are going to do anything to survive and we've proven that time and time again if it comes between feeding your kids or letting wolves in the landscape one of those is going to lose out so we got to make it so that these people can learn to live can live with wolves whether that be financial assistance or some kind of of way but we need to do this together we can't just force wolf reintroduction because we think it's good for the environment which like we said it will help the environment but it's also gotta like like you said mike it's a different environment than it was there's a lot more people there a lot more buildings houses businesses it's not the same environment that they removed from we're reintroducing them to our new environment everything has a price whether you think you're doing for something for good, it still has a price. And hopefully with wolves, the reintroduction of them, the price won't be too high. And hopefully the price won't fall on the ranchers alone. But for those listening, I would love to hear what your opinion is on wolves. Do you think we should reintroduce them? Shouldn't we? How would you help control reintroduce wolves or make sure there's fair compensation for ranchers? Now, curiosity, Nick. Where could they find us to tell us this information? Well, you can find us on Instagram and uh, Parlor if it's ever back up. But uh, those two predominantly. Most of our stuff is on Instagram. 
and uh, parlor if it ever gets back up but reach out to us there and i'll get back to you can they find us on twitter uh no they cannot find us on twitter because no amount of wolf reintroduction will ever make twitter less of a dumpster fire <laughs> every time every episode I'll, I'll, I'll always ask but out of curiosity nick now that we've discussed the broad strokes of wolves what are you reading right now i'm actually trying to figure out the uh what i'm reading right now i i have it's a mike i'll give you two guesses about what the subject my the book i'm reading is about soil nope it's close though it's it what grows in the soil that i enjoy trees trees okay i found it um i couldn't remember the author but it's called tree story it's the history of the world written in rings by valerie true and it's essentially she's a dendrochronologist so she studies tree ring data and uses that to compile climate evidence as well as do a bunch of other things like date certain archaeological sites and stuff like that and it's essentially a book about how trees helped archaeology date certain things and the history of trees and, and climate and all that so it's got it's got everything a good book needs like trees and that's it <laughs> <laughs> so what are you reading and is it about trees uh no unfortunately i'm still reading the same book i was reading last time we talked because i haven't had the opportunity to read let alone i haven't had the opportunity to sleep so reading has fallen to the to the wayside but i'm hope i'm hopefully i'll be done and i'm very excited about the next book that's on my list which i will save one or two i'm actually reading i want to thank everyone for listening and again Please, if you get the opportunity, share. Tell everyone about your friends and family about our show. And please let us know on Instagram, YouTube, and Parlor if that still exists. And we would really love to hear feedback from you. Thank you all for listening. Thanks for listening to the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We rarely finish a podcast without missing a point we wanted to bring up, so let us know what we forgot. And if you have a topic you want us to talk about, let us know at Backyard Philosophy on Instagram and Backyard Philosophy Podcast on Facebook.